When we bought these cars of the past, we promised you four huge road trips, one in each direction of the compass, and finally, we're going east. That's right. On purpose, we're going to drive 2,400 miles from Park City, Utah to the Atlantic. We're headed to Philadelphia to go to Radwood, which is the definitive show for 80s and 90s cars and culture. And along the way, there's some strange stuff to see. We're gonna experience things we would have never even done if it wasn't for a trip like this, and we're taking you with us. I love the start of road trips. I love this feeling. We were gonna do our second trip months ago. In fact, in the middle of the winter, we were gonna take these all-weather tires all the way to Texas. We were gonna make it. We were ready to rock, but they canceled the event, so we turned around and came home, and here we are, trying again. And you know what that means, gift shops. That's right. We're trying to average somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 miles or so per day in order to do this 2,400-mile trip. That's not a terribly long drive, but it is a lot of days in a row. Along the way, there'll also be some movie references and uh, probably a lot of stupidity, and hopefully, cars that run. Sitting in traffic, it's easy to forget great driving even exists. And commute cars can be boring. So we've gone back to the cars that inspired our show, now considered collector's cars that shouldn't be driven. But we're setting out on four epic road trips, one in each direction of the compass in search of amazing roads and new adventures, the four points in the great cars of the past. My odometer still doesn't work, but this pedometer works. Apparently, Porsche made that little odometer gear set out of nose cartilage, and then when they greased it up, it just works intermittently 39 years later. Interestingly enough, I am bringing less tools. That just shows you the level of confidence I have in my car. Paul has put, as you've seen, a lot of money into his 928 since we last run. I have put brand new brakes on this from our friends at PowerStop, and those are awesome. This car needed brakes, and they're great. I also have fresh new suspension. In the West Coast trip, I definitely discovered that the shocks needed to be replaced. I've had the shocks replaced with a version that is like the stock shocks. The suspension on Touring is fantastic, and the brakes, which were starting to feel pretty tired, now feel just they're on point with these PowerStop brakes. I'm very excited. On our last road trip, I talked about a cycling noise. It sounded like a synchro going bad. I, I really wasn't entirely sure what it was. And of course, in the vein of old cars, the noise has gone away, so now don't worry about it. Just keep driving until the noise comes back. Thankfully, I have a working air conditioner. <clears throat> Cannot say the same for Paul. Yeah, I have to convert the entire system to get the new R134 so I can have cool air, so it's just lukewarm air for the entire trip. Yay. So good news, you get to watch me sweat the entire way because we're expecting hot weather. I'm hoping for rain to cool me off a little bit. Otherwise, Wyoming, it's just like I remembered it. At least we don't have an ice storm. It's good. We're not gonna cover a lot of specifics about Wyoming even though there is some really cool stuff because when we go north, later for our north trip of our four points, we're gonna cover Wyoming and Montana a lot better. So. This day is gonna be just about getting across this state. I am expecting to get maybe into the 20s in miles per gallon, and we have to be doing this trip when gas is ridiculously expensive, so it's just going to hurt. So we're two hours into the trip, and here's how things are going. Pieces are falling off the car right now, so the sunroof cover that goes right here just decided to fall off. Uh, it's warm out here, and I'm hoping that I can put this back on. It might be gaff taped up, but nevertheless, the engine is great. As I was pulling in, I got an O2 sensor error code. Well, it's just this giant light on the dash, and the engine died. So it did it at the corner over here, and then as soon as I pulled in for lunch, the engine died again. Starting up isn't a problem, and I don't have an o uh, oxygen sensor light on now. And I suppose once we're moving, it's going to be just fine, but it's just at idle, and the car's pretty hot right now, so don't really know. It's the fun of a 39 year old car. The temperature has cooled down, and so everything is good, even though it's still hot in the car and I'm still a little sweaty. But this is amazing out here. 
Welcome to the middle of nowhere, Wyoming. Well, actually, technically, we're about to be in Nebraska. We are right on the border, headed for a place called Alliance, Nebraska. Now, you probably have never heard of it, probably never thought of going there. There's a specific reason to go. As a result, that means we left I-80. We are way off in the farmland. It's gorgeous back here. I mean, the road is still just a straight shot into nothingness. Once you get off the interstate, you get a real sense of how huge the U.S. is. Boy, I feel really small out here. I still can't tell if we're in Nebraska or Wyoming right now. I don't even know if we get a sign on these rural roads. Some kind of sign, anything. A cow with a sign, Nebraska, anything. There's the sign. Nebraska, the good life. And it's actually kind of pretty. I'm used to mountains, I need tall mountains, but these are rolling hills. This is different and beautiful. See, now, this is kind of magic. When you're on a road trip, you're not on the main interstate, and you discover some great driving road you had no idea existed. We're just the western edge of Nebraska, and we wind up, based on directions, on this unbelievable road right here. Two lanes both ways, this great topography. We're winding our way out of these foothills. This is what I love about taking a road trip is discovering really cool roads in the most unexpected places, sometimes when you're not even looking, but you have to get off the interstate. I may never be here again. I don't know. And we're going to Carhenge. That's right. The replica of Stonehenge in England, built in Nebraska, Northwest Nebraska, out of old cars. Everyday Driver is brought to you by Covercraft. Use the code EVERYDAY22 for 10% off your order. Porsche, please don't break today. Radwood is quite far away. Car hinge. I have a field. I have old cars. What should I do with it? I'm going to make an exact replica of Stonehenge. And of course, the question you're wondering is why I'm wondering the same question. I believe the person who made this, Jim Rainder, made this as a memorial to his dad. Why would I ever come see this unless I'm on an amazing road trip and I have a monk robe? So we're here at Carhenge and it's, it is kind of amazing. I just can't believe it exists at all. What a great way to use old cars instead of sending them to the junkyard. Build some sculpture out of them, sure. The good thing is, I don't see any 928s here, so we're good. Porsche, please don't break today. Radwood is quite far away. Day two, we are headed straight east across Nebraska. I've decided that Porsche 928s are made for the Autobahn in Germany and Nebraska. We have not dropped down to the interstate. We're staying on rural back roads and you can do freeway speeds out here. It's all good. We're finding fun places on the map that we want to visit. And then we're just going, okay, well, how do we connect the two? And we're taking whatever road is suggested to connect the two. We're not uh, like seeking out the best possible route. And what I'm surprised and pleased by is that we're still finding roads that are enjoyable. Nebraska, not as flat as I thought. Nebraska, not as flat as you think. If we were on the highway, we'd be constantly navigating the interstate with, with street signs and debris and big trucks. We've seen none of that out here. We haven't seen animals. It's just a ribbon of road that goes through nothingness and 10 minutes between someone going the opposite way. The cool thing is we can do speeds that are interstate speeds on these back roads because there is nobody out here with us. No one. Shifting into fifth at the top of fourth. That's how much room I've got to run right now. This feels like the best equivalent I will ever find to an American version of the Autobahn. And this car is loving it. Sustained high speeds. There are corners, but they're gradual. They're big sweepers that can handle a lot of speed. 
cars are a rare thing in our lives that can go from mundane and boring and normal one minute to exciting and new the next, and it just depends entirely on how you're using them as a tool. You've got to get it out on some fun road, and then when you find a fun road you didn't expect to be fun, I mean, that's like Christmas. There's not a lot out here. But it's given me great appreciation for the men and women who work the farmlands and the ranches of America. There's so much land out here. It's astounding. I had to update you. I've just seen two cars go by in a row, and I think I need to call that traffic. And we've seen no other sports cars. It's all farm equipment, pickups. There, there's no use for a sports car back here, but you should buy one because this road is great. Use autotempest.com slash everyday to find all the cars in one search. We are in search of gas, and that is because these sports cars do not want 87. They don't want, really don't want 89, and Todd's twin turbo Z is very important. I bet you I could get away with a little bit lower octane than this, but not in that Z car. We have a lot of discussions about the infrastructure issues that electric cars have because the charge stations aren't where you need them. I never thought I'd be in a situation where the gas stations don't have what I need. We got gas stations. It doesn't have what I need. It's not too often that sports cars come through in search of tasty, good 91 octane. We still feel like we're alone out here, even though there's a few more cars on the road. You crest a rise, and it drops down, and it's just more road to the horizon. Crest another rise, and it gets even longer. See, crest a rise, nothing but more road, and cows, and green pasture. At this point, we've gone by four more gas stations, all local gas stations, all with the same problem, 87 octane or diesel. So now it's taken our high-speed sports car trip down to Top Gear hypermiling. We're trying to see how far we can get. We keep checking the next station and going, all right, we can push another 20 miles, trying to find gas that is above 87 octane. I think at this point, we're all close enough to E that the next gas station we get to, we got to put something in either way. That is please get gas for me now, and I know that Paul is doing worse. So whatever this little town has at this intersection, that's the gas that's going in. Hope for good stuff. 91! I didn't think they'd have it. 91, I've never been so happy to see that in my life. Never been scared about gasoline before. That was a new experience. Never been on a road trip and thought, where are we gonna get gas? Today's the day. See, the road trip's making me grow. We actually brought along our long-term GR86 as our support vehicle and also our major camera car. We're all like luxuriating in gasoline now. You were here to share that with me. You'll be with me when we get to Iowa too. It's gonna be exciting. If you're a person that buys a Hellcat, this is your road. This is you, my friend. Hello, Hellcat. <laughs> They're here. I, I see why. You're gonna get your daily triple leaving the driveway and not have to slow down until sometime after lunch because you ran out of gas. But you can't get 91. It's a whole thing. It's a whole cycle of, uh, of enjoyment. Yeah. Wait for it. Wait for it. There it is. The people of Iowa welcome you. Hey, hey, hey. Iowa, we did it. All right, on to the next. It feels like accomplishment fields and fields and fields of cattle. It doesn't come saran wrapped. No, no, it's not plastic wrapped. That's not how beef is provided. Beef is provided by the big smelly cow things. Yep, those things that have to be fed and slaughtered. That's where the beef comes from. As we're driving along through Iowa, I keep seeing future meals. See? Steaks from the future. There they are. So far, both cars are running great. The engine on the 928 is excellent. Also, my phone has overheated, so I can't check the map. It's too hot to use. That's how hot it is in here. Pretty awesome, huh? Paul has definitely concluded that his car is better in the morning than it is as the day wears on. Apparently, uh, yeah, as it gets hot, it gets unhappy. It's like the car has arthritis is really what's going on. The joints hurt, they swell, they don't work as well as they should. There's a lot of pain involved, much complaining. This is the 928. It's just the gearbox, and I've decided that now the transmission itself is protesting against every shift. I ask it to change gears, and it asks if I have an appointment. 
I think the entire transmission just needs a full rebuild at this point. But it's still working. We're still moving. Weirdly though, I'm enjoying myself because the engine that I rebuilt is carrying me across the middle of nowhere. Despite the lack of air conditioning, despite my discomfort, despite the wind noise in this car, despite everything, I'm having a great time. Here I am doing that thing I don't like to do. I'm doing a night interview. We're driving at night. I don't I don't love it on a trip like this. Driving at night's fine, but I don't love it on a trip like this because I want to see everything we're going through. And now it's just blackness and white lines and pole position, really. I feel like some of the best driving is at night. I just, I love it, whether it's early morning or late at night. So, tomorrow, there will be gift shopping. I have to. The Z has been a fantastic companion on this trip. Today is a 600 mile day, yesterday was 550. I am wiped out. Long day of driving. And it's 92 miles to Waterloo. We're going to Waterloo, Iowa because it facilitates the things we're doing in the days to come. We're in the morning of day three. We've just passed 1,200 miles, which means we're a long way from home. But more importantly, we are halfway through the mileage of this trip. And I finally feel like we're on a road trip. It only took me 1,200 miles into our trip to really feel like that. Here we go, we're exiting now. We're in Dyersville, Iowa. I feel like the fun of a road trip isn't actually trying to get there. We want to see stuff that there's no reason for us to be anywhere near that ever again. Earlier, we passed a sign, the world's largest ball of popcorn. I mean, who else was competing? How do you know? Huh. There it is. Wow. Okay, all right. All right, we're really here. It is freaking just like in the movie. There's the house. How freaking awesome is this? Look, the gift shop. You can rent baseball equipment. Of course you can rent baseball equipment. Hey, is this heaven? No, it's Iowa. <laughs> Check it out. Leather, key fob. It says go the distance. We have gone the distance to get here. We're only halfway, but still, this feels like something. We've got it. but I think the Field of Dreams movie is one of those timeless films. Now, it's easy to watch and discount because the premise is so very absurd. But if you have enough childlike wonder in you to just go, okay, I'm just gonna go with this as if it's happening. There's so many themes in that movie. There's redemption, there's relationship of father and son, there's inspiring your kids. There's also possibly the undercurrent of uh, people that have mental health problems and have lost their mind. That's in there too, but we're leaning into the good side of that. It's a good movie. So, Field the Dream site, there you go. If you're a baseball fan, you should come. I'm, I'm a movie fan, that's why I came. Baseball, either way, but. Todd and I have just traded cars. It's been a while since I've been in the Z, and this thing is fast. It's so easy to drive, the inputs compared to the 928. The 928 is a big lumbering beast in comparison to this. I'm driving Paul's 928. Dog Lake gearbox, and a bunch of things to think about. I just got the tutorial from Paul. Doing 
good. Uh, yeah, seems like it. I wasn't apprehensive, and then he gave me the tutorial, and now I'm kind of terrified. The most I've driven this car has been just a little bit. I haven't done any distance in this car. I haven't done any, like, serious road miles. Actually, I'm going 65 now. That's the fastest I've ever even been in this car. The shifting is, uh, the shifting takes a little work. It, it just, actually, it's not work, it's thought. Because when you put the clutch in, you, you can feel so much of the mechanics and the fact that the transmission's not happy. And you know where you need to go, but you gotta think about that because it's dog leg. And then you have to kind of ease your way into every shift and, ha and actually feel the teeth connect and then slowly let the clutch out. So there's a lot of conversation going on with the car. This red line's at 6,000 RPM, so not very high. But that big V8 that Paul completely rebuilt is really happy above 4,500. So third gear is my new favorite thing. It feels like this has more power than 250 horsepower. It feels like 300, 350 in a car this big. But that's once I find it, that's up high. It feels like it kind of hunkers down and goes, all right, we're gonna go quick now, aren't we? Turbos. Well, that's fun watching the boost gauge. That's fun. That's just the lightest of turbos. The lightest of boost introduction. And we're gone. This car, once you get into the turbos, I forgot how good this car is. Yes, I wish there was air conditioning. It's hot in here already, and it's not even a very hot day outside. But... You can definitely tell this car's cruiser cred. I mean, its ability to just be a grand touring missile that just does miles. I can feel it in spite of the fact this car has its foibles. I don't have as much room in this as I thought I would. Now, I've actually got tons of leg room and shoulder room is wonderful. But my headroom is a little cramped. This car is so similar to the 928. It's not just architecture and layout. But it's where it makes its power. Even though it's turboed, roll on, and it's in the higher RPM ranges where it really comes to life. I'm doing 75 miles an hour right now at 2,000 RPM. This big V8 is laughing at what I'm requiring of it. This is, again, fifth gear, and I can tell that high-speed Autobahn work, this would be great. In spite of the issues that Paul is having with the transmission and the fact that he thinks he probably at some point should replace the shocks as well, this still just, uh, it actually rides surprisingly well and it carries its weight well. And I do feel like I could go states at a time. I would wish for air conditioning. Uh, Paul has suffered through the last couple days and I'm glad that I am in this car for a short period of time. Now, what's going on with the Z is, this needs deliberate shifting, just like the 928. You cannot rush this car. But once you get up to freeway speeds and I get all the way up into fifth gear, it just, it settles in. It becomes like a flying lounge chair. I, I'm very comfortable. I bet you Paul's getting better gas mileage than I am when he gets up to freeway speeds. But his odometer doesn't always work, so there's no counting mileage. I don't have to sing Paul's Speedo song. It's working right now. It's not right. I'm so jealous of this car right now. Air conditioning. It's not that loud in here. It's got T-tops. Seats are really great. <sighs> Paul is infected by the 928 disease. He, as a designer, is in love with the look of this 928. And I will admit that I think it's okay. I think it's unique, but I don't find it objectively beautiful. We've been driving each other's cars for a little while now, almost an hour. And it's very weird, but I think us swapping makes us appreciate our own car even more. Watching my 928, I just think, I love that thing. I love how it looks on the road. I love that it's moving, and I know Todd feels the same way about this car. Can I stop for a second and say that I really like the way the 300ZX looks? Or you don't always get the chance to see your own car rolling. I'm just looking right now, and that's, that's a good looking car. I'm a fan. I know why I bought it again. I'm reminded again. It's not just how it drives, but I love how it looks. You just don't see that car ever. You don't see Z cars very much either. I think Paul has oversold the difficulty of this car. It's still got problems, and I, it sounds like now he may have to change the transmission, which horrifies me. 
but it's not it's not as hard to drive as he makes it out to be. I mean, he gave me the whole class that was a school, whatever was testing at the end. But ultimately, it's a car, and you just have to have, build a relationship with it and understand. Oh, it doesn't like that. I'm glad I got to drive this on this trip. It's very fun. It's very different. What I'm pleased about is both of us did buy cars to go across the country with. Both of us bought really good road trip cars. Mine's just better dialed in than Paul's. The Z is far faster. It drives better. It handles better. It's just a better place to be. Look, it has air conditioning. What is this cold air coming out of the vents? It's so good to be here. This is such a great road trip car. But I still love my 928. Huh, okay. All right, I see it. I recognize why it's good. I want to be back in my car. I want to be back in the Z. And driving this now, I keep thinking, I kind of want to keep the Z forever. I wasn't really planning on it. I don't know that I will, but driving this car makes me think that should be in my garage for all time. Is that bad? Should I tell Paul? Hmm. It's so fascinating to watch it in the rearview mirror. Fascinated by the 928. It's just interesting and it's built for the long haul, but so is the Z car. It's not like Paul bought some little tiny buzzy thing and he's gonna hate a road trip. I can see why you'd like a road trip in here. I mean, please fix the air conditioning and hopefully the transmission can be resolved because that would make it much just easier. I think the big freeway sweepers are my favorite thing in this car. There's a little adjustment to the wheel and the car just settles into the arc and flows through it. It's actually very nice. It feels really wonderful. I'm still sweating. <clears throat> yeah, it's hot in here. Okay, I'll just enjoy my time being here. I'll just enjoy looking at mine, dreading, I mean, waiting for the time when I get back in it. It's like an old friend though. It's just so cool to see it rolling. Yeah, 928. I see the pros, and I am living with the cons. That's where we're at. Meanwhile, Iowa. So I'm back in the Z. It's bright in here, which I actually do like. It just took a minute to get used to it. Seats are good. Body position is significantly better. I was leaned way too far back in the 928, and I've got like a half inch. That's, that's pretty great. I'm thrilled with that. I like this car. This is not a light car. This is a 3,600 pound car, but it just feels, it, it feels like it's 500 pounds lighter than the 928. It's not, but it sure feels like it. Paul's got a very interesting, really cool GT car in his own right. That is quite a grand touring machine. Just having air conditioning would transform that car. Going through construction, gotta cool the pits. Ah. Ah. Driving these two cars back to back has me thinking about this whole era of cars, the 80s and 90s era that we're celebrating by going to Redwood. What was going on in this era of cars, especially in the 80s, was that a lot of the cars that were cool cars didn't also need to be good cars. They're great to lust after though, let's see. There's the 959, there's the Ferrari F40, there's the Lamborghini Countach, of course that came from the 70s. There's the Testarossa. In the 90s, you add the McLaren F1, but one that often gets forgotten about is a favorite of mine, the Jaguar XJ220. This is one of my top three cars I've most wanted to drive in the entire world, and I am, I, I may need a minute. This car was introduced in 1988, and somehow, in spite of being a car guy, I completely missed it. I had no idea it existed. I first saw this car in the early 2000s. I didn't know what it was. It was in an exotic car dealership around the corner from where Paul lived in Los Angeles. And I just mentioned to him, I was like, I saw this crazy car, but I don't even know what it was. He knew. Ah, uh, the Jaguar XJ220. When Jaguar presented this car as the concept, they presented it with a V12 engine from Jaguar, it should have had four-wheel drive and it should have had active aerodynamics and rear-wheel steering and a theoretical top speed of 220 miles an hour. Once they got to building it, many things changed. It came with a 3.5 liter V6. It didn't have all-wheel drive and no active aero. 
it was less in the eyes of many customers who pulled their deposit and said, we're angry. Some of those people sued and lost against Jaguar for not making the car they were promised. By the time they stopped making them in 94, those 1,500 orders had dwindled to 281 cars, many of the last ones you could get for half price. And for a while it held the top speed record, and that was until the McLaren F1 came out with a V12 engine and set an actual top speed of 240 miles an hour. But it still wound up looking like this and having supercar stats. The 0 to 60 was in the threes. This car was beat on by a race driver until they got a seven and a half minute Nürburgring time in the 90s. That was quick. At the time, it was the fastest production car record on the Nürburgring before all of us were obsessed with that. I am shocked at how tight this cockpit is. If you look at photos, if you look how big the car is, it's as long as an Escalade. But of course the cabin, I, I'm crammed in here. The cabin's pretty little. I knew, I, I'd been told I wouldn't fit well and I don't fit well. There's nothing ergonomic about this. And yet, I really like it because of its influence on the automotive world. And all I see is roll cage and reflection of the engine and a kind of a tiny little sliver, like a mailbox slot. Oh, those brakes are no power and hard. Okay, work the wheel, no power steering. But you know, this car never struck me. It never really hit me like it hit Todd. And the main reason was because I was so disappointed with Jaguar. They let me down. I have read every stat and spec about this car. I've read it all. I feel like I know everything about this car. And as soon as I'm driving it, I don't know anything. This is unlike everything that I imagined the XJ220 to be. They couldn't do the V12, even though it had race pedigree. And that's what everybody wanted, but then they didn't know where to put a gas tank or a trunk or kind of a person, frankly. It ended up being this V6 twin turbo monster. They promised 500 horsepower. They delivered 542. This is the first Jaguar V6 in their history. And it had its roots in a Cosworth DFV Formula One engine. It's got twin turbos but it's also at a 90 degree V, which means it kind of sounds like a truck engine. This engine was proven to be a monster. The test vehicle for this twin turbo 3.5 liter V6 was a transit van, and they got the transit van to do almost 180. Keep in mind, this was built for a 220 mile an hour top speed, and they almost got there. Most people that tested it got about 213 out of it. So Jaguar took Martin Brundle and a car with no cats and about 50 extra horsepower as a result out to the Nardo test circuit, and they got 217, just shy of what they were hoping for. Its party piece is the fact that that V6 twin turbo has just gobs of speed if you can get your way through the gears. The shifts are really long and very tight, very crisp, but they're very long. Oh, don't try to shift while turning. It's too hard. That's second gear. I'm fighting the weight of this car. This is like a huge ship. I'm astounded. This car doesn't feel as light as it is. It weighs a little over 3,000 pounds. It spreads its weight out well. It feels very stable, but it almost feels frustratingly stable, frustratingly large at low speeds. You have to find some heat for it. You have to find some speed. Let the engine work. Then you realize the genius of what they've done here is all in the arrow and the chase of high speed. It's difficult to drive the XJ220. The only time you want to be in it is on a straight line at speed. Moving fast, it's not a track car like you would think. Now, 
this car actually still won Le Mans in its division and then was disqualified on technicality. So it was raced, but I can't imagine racing this. Not on anything tight. I mean, Le Mans got the big back straight. You would have loved that. In a sense, this car is like the SR71 Blackbird. It's not until it's at speed, doing its thing that it was actually designed for, where it finally all works. I keep trying to keep some speed in this car, even on somewhat tighter corners, because I realize that with speed, it gets better. You never really shed the weight or the size, but the pleasant surprise is what happens when you give it any speed at all, because then it settles and it locks down and you feel the arrow and the thinking and the fact that the goal was well over 200 miles an hour in the 90s. And it's still so thrashy. That's the fastest corner I've done in this car. And it is like fighting a huge truck. There's a company in England that actually takes these and makes the doors open all the way because they kind of crack. Makes big people like me fit in them. Does better brakes. That would be a lot of great modernization to take this car and make it into something you actually want to use. Because right now, this is the kind of thing you want to take to a Cars and Coffee or you want to put it on a road or a runway where you can really get speed. Let's put aside maintenance and tires and wheels and the care and feeding and the upgrades. Everything you want to make this car run. This is nowhere close to a daily. This isn't a Bugatti Veyron. This is a car that goes very fast, but isn't quite right going slow. This is a showpiece. It's either got to be going 220 miles an hour, which it really didn't, or it's got to be sitting still in a museum. This 3.5 liter V6, that's a choice ahead of its time. Of course, everybody looked down on it at the time, but now that's kind of a moment of genius. McLaren Artura, Ferrari 296 GTB, the Maserati MC20, the Nissan GTR, and the 4 GT. All of them have twin turbo V6s, which means this is a car that is 30 years too soon. This is the car that you want now, and yet it's not. This is a special car. It's a special experience. It's not that much fun, and that's comparing it to the modern, light, quick stuff that we drive now. This, this is designed for something different but it's no less special. Look how gorgeous this car looks. If it is not part of art history books, it should be. This is how you design a car. But everything else, to me, is the wrong recipe. I'm meeting a hero. And he's a little old. His best years are behind him. The sheen has come off. But look at this thing. such an interesting car. And I'm a collector of interesting cars. I've got one, I'm driving it now. There's still a raw feeling to me about the 928. Raw as in mechanical thrash. I feel it through the shifter. I feel it in the gas pedal. You hear it, every input. I'm intrigued by the 928 for that reason. And I'm willing to overlook its faults. As a matter of fact, I'd still rather be in this. There's more space. I like it better. So that Jaguar proves that not everything that is great looking is also great to drive. And this is also an era of cars when things were built for a purpose and the other things outside of that purpose, it just doesn't do well. One of the only cars in the modern time that actually is like that is my Lotus Elise, which is fantastic to drive for all of the realities of driving, but any of the kind of daily stuff doesn't like that. That's very old school supercar thinking, but in this era, that was the modern way you did it. This is when I'm thankful for the normal daily stuff that the 300ZX can do, but I'm also just comfortable. We've been taking the time now just to put down the miles. Fortunately, today is not as long as yesterday, but we're still just over halfway right now. 
I didn't think when we set out on this journey that there would be a subplot about octane of gasoline. I just, I didn't think it would matter. I never thought we'd be talking about it. But we are, and there's been a twist in the story. In our ongoing search for 91, we didn't find 91, we found 93. 93 octane. I've never put a tank of 93 in this car, ever. We just filled up with 93 octane. Have you ever had 93 octane in your car? If you've never had 93 octane in your car, you should have 93 octane in your car because 93 octane is really good gas. It just changes everything. I don't care what it costs. Work harder, make more money, put 93 octane in your car. 93 octane in your car is really what you want. I love 93 octane. Let's make this car come to life. Over my shoulder is the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. I've wanted to come here since I was a kid. I grew up watching the Indy 500 and now I'm here but the gate's closed, and I'm bummed that I can't get an Indy 500 keychain and add to my burgeoning keychain collection. Nevertheless, we've made it here. We're moving on. We are leaving Indianapolis, Indiana, which is actually a pretty cool city, at least the parts of it we got to see. Well, today is day four, and this is where things get interesting, because the entire point of our trip is to get out in a car, ideally in a sports car, and go find a good road to drive. We're headed to an area of Ohio south of Columbus called Hawking Hills. It's actually used as kind of a test loop or an enthusiast driving loop for car and driver and others coming down from the Michigan area. We had fewer changes in geography in the last day and a half than we had in the entire first day and a half. Once we got to Illinois, everything's kind of the same. I know there's subtle changes happening, but this middle swath here, this is what it's looked like for days. We're about three hours from Hawking Hills, and that's gonna be our highlight of the day. I'm now in the mode where this is all I wanna do. It's taken me four days to get here, but finally, this is all we do. I just want a road trip, just drive. That's all I wanna do. Yeah, there's a lot to deal with. There's city traffic, there's stupid drivers, there's trucks, there's construction, but this is where it's at, so I challenge you. We challenge you, get out here, find a great car to drive. Don't let it own you. The truth is you get within about an hour of the Hawking Hills area and the roads become great. They're lush trees, tight roads. There's not a lot of sight lines, but it just becomes interesting driving again. The houses and the farms that are going by, that's good to look at. You've got elevation changes. The roads already are a hundred times better than these double highways we've been going on. And we haven't even gotten to the good part yet. I like that it's not just one of those destination roads where there's nothing, 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 and then all of a sudden the road is good. This is interesting already. It's warming you up for the drive to come. We're in the Hawking Hills area on the road used by many enthusiasts and other automotive outlets. There's actually twisty roads and corners and hills. Hello, Ohio. We're at Hawking Hills State Park and the gift shop that I so hope to go into closed. The thing that I'm struck by most is the combination of hills and turns. Usually in Utah, we've got gradual sweepers, we've got tight turns, but they're not over undulating hills like this. It makes it different, a little more technical, which is good. And you're feeling the weight shift of the car. I also like that it feels flowing. It's made for GT cars like ours. It's not just hardcore sports cars like the GR86 or Cayman's and Lotai. This is gorgeous. Sunlight filtering, the road dropping away. You know what I should do? Sport mode on the suspension. Yeah. The car is much more on its toes. The body responses are much sharper. Well, the body responses are sharper. They're not, they're not revolutionized, but they're definitely sharper. I genuinely had no idea the roads were this good. We're not booking through here, and there's tourists and people and the inn and spa and hikers, and you don't want to be coming through here too fast, but it's just enjoyable. This car also doesn't want to be rushed. You can very much tell. It's doing it, and it's a Porsche, and it likes being driven, but it doesn't want to be rushed. So 
listen to that. Listen to that V8. That is so good. Porsche V8. That just makes me happy. I can see why this is the exercise area. I can, I can actually get it. Now, unless you got here like crack of dawn early in the morning, there's too much varied traffic on it to really push a car hard. But you do get a sense of the suspension in a big, big way. Holy crud, that's a truck. Truck, truck, truck. Big, big truck. Yeah, see, mm. Can you imagine being in a six-figure car on this road and a truck like that comes around the corner? Uh, that would be clinching. Let's let's just let's just describe it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Might need the backup drawers. If you don't have any twisty roads near you, this is worth the drive. It's not high speed because of all the tourists and activity and everything going on, but still, it's going to give you your fix. This is good. I'm impressed. The way the road rolls, the way it makes the car lift on its suspension and then compress it to the bottom of a corner, you can really tell how well the car handles its weight and deals with motions as a result of this road. See, look at this. The sign right there, it exactly matches our t-shirt, happiness ahead. It's exactly what we say. This twisty road inspired the t-shirt or maybe the other way around. This has a more pronounced tight corner area with changes in elevation than some of the roads getting here, but a lot of the stuff to get to this area is actually a little more open. You've got better sight lines and you can actually enjoy your car a bit more without random hikers. Compared to some of the stuff we've driven where we're just humming along for hours and avoiding 18-wheelers and dealing with traffic on the edges of cities, this is a celebration of driving. But it's nice to get a break. And the best part about a road trip is coming to a place like this. It's like a little reward. I'm glad we took this time to come over to Hawking Hills to experience this area. I love this part about traveling across all these states, getting off the interstate, finding the back roads, and then being surprised by how good a road is. I mean, this one, it's been discovered. It's not news to anybody. There's been plenty of them that have been brand new and exciting, and that's why we've liked this trip so much. Yep, this is a good reward. If you haven't checked out Hawking Hills in Ohio, you gotta come here. Oh, hey, look. <laughs> chickens actually crossing the road. Two, four, six. There's actually chickens crossing the road. Right. And no, I don't know the answer. And we're just making time now. Headed for West Virginia, a state I've never been to in my entire life. Yet another one on that list. There's been a lot on this trip. We're going to try to stay there tonight, and then we're going to push our way into Philadelphia tomorrow for both a meetup with many of you that want to meet up with us, which is awesome, and also Radwood on Saturday. It is day five of our road trip. This is all we do. It's what it seems like. Wake up, have breakfast, coffee goes in, hit the road. And I love this. I love this feeling of finding out what's next. We had an interesting time getting into Morgantown last night. Honestly, I'm realizing my own ignorance about the East Coast. Places like Morgantown are incredibly tight and hilly, and we were having a lot of issue just navigating the town to our hotel last night and then this morning. A local even looked at us and said, I can't believe you guys brought those low cars into West Virginia. So apparently, the whole state doesn't, doesn't welcome sports cars. This stretch this morning, Highway 68, it's coming up out of West Virginia where we started this morning and it goes actually through Maryland and will get us up into Pennsylvania. That area has been so much fun. I never expected the hills of West Virginia. I never expected the winding road and the fun of this road at high speed. It's labeled for 70. Most people are doing well above that. And it, it almost feels like the asphalt equivalent of downhill skiing. We have been bombing up and down these hills. We've been doing these long, fast sweepers as we drop into valleys. The 300ZX has been incredibly at home. It hunkers and it just sticks so well. And the high speed sweepers is where this car shines the most. Really, really tight stuff. And this car starts to feel a little big. I 
feeling pretty good about myself. The car's doing great, and I'm very, very happy with that. Not that I thought it wouldn't, but you never know. The further we've gotten into our trip, the more at ease I've become. I am. Um, I had a little trepidation, just getting through everything, not knowing what we were gonna find out, but that was kind of part of the fun. And I'm feeling good. At this point, I'm just enjoying, because I know it's gonna end very soon. When we started these road trips, I, I really wanted them to be a nice kind of travel log of these crazy adventures that we're having. I didn't expect how strongly I would want you to take a road trip. I want you to get out there and be in a car and see parts of the U.S. you haven't seen before because we have so many great roads. Even as a car guy, as a guy that gets to drive for this show, I don't always think about the great roads that could get me somewhere totally new. I have my roads, I do my circuits, and I'm kind of done. I feel like we should all take at least one big road trip a year. Just drive somewhere, see something new, have the car get you there, and wonder at how big the U.S. is and all the crazy things we have here. And sometimes crazy people. Yeah, that happens everywhere, but it's true here as well. Gettysburg is our next stop. Then just a couple hours more after that until we get to Philadelphia. We are in the middle of nowhere in, on our way to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I'm sitting at a one lane bridge in a back road. I, the road's been spectacular. It's been up and down and tight and fun. And I have to think that this route we are using to get to Gettysburg has to be the exact opposite of the way most people get there. Because if, if everybody at Gettysburg was driving sports cars on these roads, there would have been nothing to fight about. It's been wonderful. It's just made me laugh because there's no chance that this is how most people get there. I'm in Pennsylvania. What am I doing in Pennsylvania? Oh, that's right, Redwood. We did stop in the town of Gettysburg and pondered the history. Four score and five days ago, we began this journey. Booth, party of one, Booth. Ah, uh, yes, rain pushed us out. Gettysburg, we hardly know you. It's a very cool town. It was an interesting place to visit. We got some lunch. We did our stupid gags. Gettysburg jokes, it's too soon, man. It's too soon. But we didn't really get a chance to dive into what all's there, which was a lot. We've got to keep going. Westchester is our destination for today. Radwood isn't until tomorrow, but we have to get there today. We've got to wash off the cars, even though the rain's doing a great job already. When we bought these cars and decided to do big road trips, honestly, no part of me thought we were going to drive all the way to the Atlantic. I thought we'll drive eastward, we'll stop somewhere, because we're based two thirds across the country from here. I didn't think we were gonna drive one way all the way out here. But I'm really glad we did take a trip that was that long. I'm glad we made the effort to come this far. The cars have done very well. It's been a crazy adventure. I've seen states I never imagined being in and have found a lot of roads that were much better than I expected because I just, I feared the boring interstate and we've rarely had that. We are close to our ending for the trip, that is the Westchester and Philadelphia area, and we're getting into lots of stop and go traffic, lots of stoplights, and the Z has decided it's tired. First gear is not happy about sinking. There's a nasty crunch. It's it's not, it doesn't sound good. Let's just go with that. I, I Look, things are old. It's the original transmission. I've got 83,000 and a half miles. So uh, yeah, it's time for stuff to be a little worn. You'll probably hear it here in a second. When I when I put it into gear, it's not it's not a good noise. Oh, of course, that time it worked because we're talking about it. it. It knows, so it decided it would just slot perfectly silently and fine. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's a nasty, nasty clunk. At least it worked. There you go. At least I can put it in gear. I'm not having any of those issues. Okay, I'm walking now. I'm good.
Everyday Driver is brought to you by Griot's Garage. Use the code EDRIVER for 10% off your order. We made it. We're at Radwood. We actually got here 2,400 miles, and we're currently at Radwood. The scale of this is enormous. I haven't even seen the whole show yet. We've barely gotten started. I'm just excited that the cars got here. I'm seeing Ford probes, rabbit pickup trucks, perfect Subaru brats. Of course, we're here at Subaru Park in Philadelphia, right on the water. And I cannot believe, I knew I would like the show, but I didn't realize I would connect with it this much. I can't believe how many cars are here. There's cars here that I'm sitting here going, wait a minute, I don't even know what that is. You gotta walk over and you gotta look. The Subaru Vivio T-Top. I've never seen one in my life. Look at how little this is. I mean, I'm a big guy, but come on. How often do you even go to a car show and you see something you've never seen before? That would be on the list for me. Of course, it's a K car, but it also fits the era. Here's a Pontiac Grand Prix SE. Stare at your, the center of your steering wheel to be distracted and figure out which button does which while you're driving. Now we have phones, but the original distraction. Grand Prix. That's a combination. Combination lock for your glove box? For your glove box. Oh, oh man. A Prowler? The, the Prowler doesn't seem yeah. this old to me. Granted, the Prowler's problem was that it always seemed old and yet was new and wasn't what it could have been. For It was a confusing car. Tennis racket stitching in the door panels for tennis so you can take your sub tennis. That's it. We've covered cars for golf. These are cars for tennis. And he's got an eject button for the passengers, so that helps. That's good. I'm reliving my childhood. I'm watching cars drive in going, oh my gosh, I haven't seen one of those in decades. Radwood is a very unique show. You can do Snooty. It's based on Goodwood. That's as snooty as it gets. You can do the Monterey show. That's a show that kind of tells you to keep out. This is the reason that Radwood was invented, because the guys that started it, Art, Lane, and Warren, they had cars of this era, and they didn't feel welcome at shows, so they made Radwood. And now, frankly, it's kind of the best. You see exotic cars, and you don't connect with them. But that's what I realized, and I told Todd, I said the younger generation is now connecting with and driving some cars they don't have any reason to connect with. Also, bikes? I didn't even know these BMX bikes were still around. I've seen BMX bikes. Somebody over there has the entire 80s and 90s catalog of road and track. And there is a guy wandering around who looks like Magnum PI. One guess what car he brought. I'm just thrilled that we can exhibit our cars and really be a part of this. And thanks to the Radwood guys and Haggerty for kind of featuring our cars right in the middle. They're nowhere close to being as nice as some of these are. But here's the thing, we're proud to have driven our cars here. Then we're encouraging some other owners to get out and drive theirs too. But we're not quite done yet. Because if we're going to drive all the way to Philadelphia, there's one more thing we just have to do. What are we doing? Why are we running? We brought cars. <laughs> we gotta go. <laughs> there they are. We made it. We're in Philly. The cars are right down there. We made it all the way to Philadelphia. The cars made it here. Successful East trip. Yeah, for sure. We are a long way from home, but we're not done with road trips. Ending this trip is bittersweet. We also had more fun than we expected. We did even more miles than we expected. 
and we can't wait to go again. Radwood is quite far away. Four score and 1,776 gear shifts ago, we began our journey. Rocky is a big movie for this town. Well, you'll also notice there isn't a bronze statue of a car somewhere. There's not an F1 car. That's, yeah. Driven was not a good movie. He wrote Driven too. That one wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs>